Glad to see so many happy faces on this wild and windy day. Are you all ready to go looking for whales? I'm Tony, and our other guide today is Dale. We'll be using these two rubber boats you see here, and our trip today will take three hours. In a few minutes, we'll be heading into part of the largest temperate rainforest of the Pacific Northwest. I'll show you our route on the map here. This is where we are now. We'll be leaving the sheltered bay and heading out across the mouth of the bay toward the open water. As you know, last night there were strong winds in the area, so we can't go out into the ocean as we had planned. Near the mouth, the water will be quite rough. That's where we are most likely to spot orcas, or killer, whales, as they are also called. After crossing the mouth of the bay, we'll enter the calmer, shallower waters. This is where you look for gray whales. Then we will continue up this narrow inlet close to the shore. You will have a great view of giant fir and cedar trees that have never been logged. Here is the place to watch for wildlife. You are likely to see bears along the shore and eagles in the sky overhead. Right at the back of the inlet here are the hot springs where we will be stopping for an hour. You can have a soothing soak in bubbling hot water before the return trip. I'll tell you a little bit about the whales now, because with the noise of the wind and the engine, you won't be able to hear much out there. As we head out in the boat, we will probably see dolphins first. They are a gray color and quite small, one to two meters long. They will swim right beside the boat, racing along and sometimes jumping out of the water just ahead of us. They swim very fast, and they are playful and curious. They're really fun to watch. The next ones we'll see are orcas, or killer whales, which are actually members of the dolphin family. They are seven to eight meters long, very fast, and they have sharp teeth. Some stay in these waters all year round. We identify them by the distinctive black and white color. They feed mainly on salmon in these waters, but the orca diet can include seabirds, seals, dolphins, and other mammals. They can be fierce hunters, and this is why they are called killer whales. We should start watching for them as soon as we get out toward open water. We're likely to spot the orcas from a considerable distance. Watch for the black and white marking and mist spouting from the blowholes on top of their heads. Just outside the inlet is where we will probably see gray whales. The grays are migratory. They pass through here twice a year, moving from far in the north where they feed to the warm southern waters where they breed. You are very lucky today because several have been reported in the area. Unlike the orcas, grays are solitary, except when you see a mother with a calf. The gray whales are much longer and heavier than the orcas, 14 meters long and weighing up to 30 tons. The gray whales are filter feeders, gathering tiny ghost shrimp from the sand at the bottom. We recognize grays from their tail fins because each one is different. Once we find the whales, we'll come up as close as we can safely. We are allowed to approach the whales no closer than 50 meters, but that feels pretty close when you are in the presence of animals this big. You'll see mist coming out of the blowholes when they breathe out, and you'll hear a loud hiss. If we are downwind, we might even be able to smell them, a strong, fishy smell. Now, for just a few words of caution, it will be quite bouncy out there, especially in the front of the boat. If you want a smoother ride, stay in the middle of the boat, close to the engine. Hold on to the ropes and keep an eye on any big waves. Be alert so you don't get thrown out of the boat. In case of an emergency, you are all wearing survival suits. They'll keep you warm and dry in or out of the water. They are bright orange for visibility. The water temperature is around 8 degrees. Without these suits, you would only last a few minutes in this cold water. With these suits, your survival time is increased dramatically. They will keep you upright in the water even if you can't swim. But we don't expect anybody to end up in the water, so don't worry. Now, are there any questions? I'm afraid of getting seasick. Right. I was just coming to that. If you think you might get seasick, take one of these patches and put it on your arm at the wrist, like this. It works on pressure points of the body and will relieve seasickness without the drowsiness you can get from pills. Are there any other questions? All right, then. Let's start loading up the boats. We leave in five minutes.
First of all, a warm welcome to Barker's Country Safaris. We're delighted to have you all on board for this season. I know you've all been told a bit about the company when you had your job interview, but I thought it would be worth telling you a bit more about ourselves. Barker's was set up 10 years ago by myself, John, and my then girlfriend and now wife, Nancy. We started it initially just as a hobby. We felt that there was a good opportunity to share our love of the countryside in this part of the world with the many visitors who come here. As you know, most people come for the beaches in the summer, but there is so much more to the region and this is what we wanted to exploit. Nancy and I were born near here and as teenagers we went climbing, kayaking, white water rafting, potholing and just straightforward walking. This district is in our blood and we love it. <laughs> While we were still at university, we started taking small groups of visitors out into the national park in Nancy's brother's old Land Rover. We'd drive them around the back lanes and into the forest. We'd also organise rock climbing tours for friends of friends. Then, each year, without us having to advertise, people came back to us to ask for more excursions and trips. So, five years ago, we gave up our other jobs to focus full-time on Barker's Country Safaris. Now, two years after that, we set up the activity tour part of the business, and one year ago, we expanded into organising activities for school groups during term time. Obviously, this was a massive challenge with all the health and safety requirements, but it's proving a great success. Anyway, we'll certainly not be dealing with school parties during the summer holidays. Our clients for the next three months are mostly family parties or groups of friends, and I'd like to talk a bit now about the tours we offer and what your responsibilities will be. Our most popular excursion is the Woodland Tour and Trail. Now, often this is sold out and we have all of our 10 Jeeps in convoy with eight people in each Jeep. It's a lot of fun. These tours really offer a taster of what we can provide. So as both driver and guide, it is important that you do a good job here so they come back for the bigger tours. Uh, I will talk about the commission package later. As the summer days are so long, we have three tours each day, but you will not be expected to work on more than two of them. Morning tours start at 8 a.m. and go to midday. Afternoon tours are from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. And then evening ones, 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. All the tours follow the same route and you should have made yourselves familiar with all the key information. This was provided to you in the information pack you were sent when you accepted the job offer. This is important, so if you haven't had time yet, please do so now. Our second most popular tour is the Family Exclusive. Now, this tour is for the whole day and for only one group. Usually it is just one Jeep, but sometimes there are two if the party is large. These tours go from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. and include lunch at the Brown Bear in Lower Middleton. We have a number of different routes for these tours as we don't want our premium clients being made to feel that they are part of a large package deal. Uh, you will be told which route to take with your weekly schedule. Now, I'd like to move on to these specialty tour packages. These are the ones that we are keen to book people on once they've done the Woodland Tour and Trail trip. Yes, I'd like to know something about the British medical scheme. Yes, what's your question? Can I use British doctors if I fall ill? That will depend on how long your course of study is. If it is six months or more, then you are entitled to treatment from the British medical scheme, called the National Health Service, NHS, as if you were a British citizen. With the NHS, consultations with doctors are free, but you will be asked to pay something towards the cost of medicines. In 1987, this is £2.40 for each item of medicine. You are also entitled to free treatment in British hospitals. Always make sure the doctor knows you want treatment from the NHS, as doctors also take private patients, who pay the full cost of all their treatment. How do I make sure I can be treated by the NHS? If you are eligible for treatment, that is, 
you are registered on a course of six months or longer, then the first thing you should do is to register with a doctor. You should register with any doctor close to where you live. Local post offices have lists. All you need to do is visit the doctor or the doctor's receptionist during consulting hours and ask to be included on the doctor's list of patients. If the doctor decides to accept you, you will then be sent a medical card by post, which will carry your National Health Service number. Take great care not to lose this. If the doctor cannot accept you, try elsewhere or contact the local family practitioner committee. You can get the address from the post office or any doctor. Find out your doctor's consulting hours from the doctor or the receptionist and ask whether or not you need to make an appointment before seeing the doctor. Remember to be on time for any appointment you make. You can see him or her during those hours unless you are seriously ill. If you are seriously ill, the doctor can be called out to see you. Once you have registered, you should tell your warden, landlord, landlady or a friend the name, address and telephone number of your doctor, so that if you are suddenly taken ill, the doctor can be called out to see you. I see. Could you tell me something about British hospitals? Yes. Hospitals provide specialist treatments, or treatment for which any kind of extended stay is required. Your doctor will recommend you to go if it is necessary. Casualty or emergency treatment following accidents is free for everyone. As not all hospitals provide such services, you should find out which local hospitals do in case you ever need treatment. How about dental care in Britain? You can find lists of dentists who give National Health Service treatment at local main post offices. You do not register with a dentist, but you should ask whether they are willing to give you NHS treatment. As dentists are free to accept or refuse patients and to provide private treatment only. If you are accepted, you should give the dentist the NHS number which is on your medical card. There is a charge for all dental treatment. For basic treatment, this could be up to £17. More extensive dental treatment will cost more if you are not registered with a doctor. You will have to pay the full cost of dental treatment as a private patient. You will have to make an appointment to see your dentist and should give notice if you are unable to attend an appointment or you will be charged for loss of time. You should try to have your teeth checked at least once per year by the dentist. From the NHS, you are entitled to a free six monthly checkup. Thank you very much. This helps me a lot. Hi Barbara. What will you do this weekend? Well, I'd like to do some shopping, but I have no idea where to go. I've only been here a few days. I was told London is an expensive place to live. Yes, but that's not completely true. London can be an expensive place to live, but if you shop in the right places, you can live relatively cheaply. Is that true? Could you tell me something about the shops? All right. You know, food tends to be cheapest in the big supermarkets, like Sainsbury's and Tesco's. Most of them have quite a good variety of food and household items. You can buy your fruit and vegetables on the street. You will find these street markets in almost every part of London. You can also buy clothes, shoes and household items in these markets for a real bargain. Have you got a market list provided by the Student Union? Here you are. This might give you some ideas. Let me see. E Street SE17. This market sells cheap food, clothes and hardware. It's open from 8am to 5pm. Yes, but how can I get there? You can take the underground. We call it the tube. You see, there is a tube station on the list. Let me see. Yes, it's Castle Station. Right. You can get off at the castle. Good. Look at Leather Lane, WC1. Yes, that's a good central London market for clothes, food and hardware. It opens at lunchtimes from Monday to Friday. It's near Chancery Lane Station. Well, what about the one in Petticoat Lane? Oh, Petticoat Lane E1. It sells clothes shoes and household goods. It opens only on Sunday mornings from 9am to 12 noon. Yes, we can get off at Oldgate Station. OK, what about the one in Walthamstow, E17? Oh, that's a big market for clothes and food. It, it's open between 9am to 4pm on Mondays to Saturdays, except Wednesdays and Sundays. Let me see. 
Yes, we can get there on the central line. What about Brixton? That's Brixton SW9. It's an indoor and outdoor market with a lively atmosphere. It sells vegetables from all over the world. It opens 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Mondays to Sundays and half days on Wednesdays. Oh, it's close to Brixton Station. Very near my place. Great. It's very convenient. Tell me more detail about Camden Lock. Yes, there are several markets on Camden High Street and plenty of shops. They sell fashion clothes, jewelry, recorders, and pottery. It's good for buying presents. Very close to Chalk Farm and Camden Town Station. I see. It says that it opens on Sundays only, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Well, I think these markets might help to keep my costs down. Well, if you need to buy new electrical goods or large household items, you can wait until the January sales, when almost all the shops sell goods at discount prices. Thank you very much for your help, Tom. Shall we go to Brixton together this weekend? I'd love to. Oh, I'm afraid I've got to go to a lecture. I will ring you tonight. Bye. Okay, bye. Four oh one oh six two five. Hello, is that you, Tom? Hi, Barbara. Have you decided where to go tomorrow? Yes, that's right. I want to go to Camden Town to shop. Would you like to go there with me? Yes, I'd love to. That's a good market. Mary's here with me now. She wants to go there too. Shall we meet at Camden Town Station? Okay. How are you going there? We will go there by bus. It's only three stops from my place. Well, we might walk there if the weather is fine. How will you get there? I think I will have to take the underground. I'm at Bond Street, and I'll take the Central Line first and get off at Tottenham Court Road. That's it. Take the Central Line and get off at Tottenham Court Road. Then you want the Northern Line to Camden Town. It's only about four stops. Make sure you get a northbound train, though. You want northbound Camden Town, okay? Okay. I think I can find the way. I have an underground map with me now. What time shall we meet there tomorrow? How about ten thirty? Well, I think that's a bit too late. It might be crowded by that time. How about one hour earlier? Say nine thirty. Fine, that'll be all right. See you tomorrow. Bye. With us in the studio today are Dr. Peter Collins, a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology at the University of Chicago, and Helen Gardner, the author of the book Deep Sleep. They've come to our studio to discuss the effects of sleep deprivation and also give some tips to the sleep deprived on how to deal with the problem. Welcome to the studio, Helen and Peter. Now, Peter, what are the reasons for sleep deprivation, and how can it affect our lives? The research into sleep deprivation started in the late 50s and has been going on ever since. Many researchers link sleep deprivation with electricity, television, and computers, which have enabled humans to work 24/7. Before electricity was invented, people's body clocks were synchronized with the sun's schedule, and the average time they spent sleeping was eight to nine hours a night. By 1975, that average was down to seven hours, and today one third of us sleep less than six hours a day. This leads to a condition called chronic sleep deprivation. Basically, means going for extended periods of time with less sleep than your body needs. Chronic sleep deprivation can cause a variety of physical and psychological problems. At its most basic level, loss of sleep can make us more irritable and less efficient, and can affect long-term memory and concentration, which can result in more accidents. According to the latest research into sleep deprivation, sleep deprivation is the main reason for three percent of plane crashes, ten percent of domestic accidents, twenty percent of accidents at work. And 45% of all traffic accidents. Research into the physical effects of chronic sleep deprivation suggests more serious and significant long-term complications. Research from my university, the University of Chicago, has shown that sleep deprivation interferes with how the human body regulates insulin and sugar metabolism, which can increase the risk of diabetes. People who are sleep deprived have weakened immune systems. And are more prone to viruses and other kinds of infections. People who don't get enough sleep have cognitive problems or difficulties processing and assimilating new information. Lack of sleep affects long-term memory and slows down such abilities as judgment and reaction times. Some researchers link sleep deprivation with obesity, indicating that sleep disorders and eating disorders are often linked. Helen, you've done a fair amount of research for your recent book on helping people deal with sleeping problems. Could you give our listeners some tips on managing their sleep? 
Well, if you spend several hours a night tossing and turning in bed, trying to fall asleep, you first have to find out how much sleep you need. To do so, you'll need to try and sleep six to nine hours a night. Set aside three days for the experiment. It's best to do it on a long weekend or a holiday to ensure it doesn't get interrupted. During the experiment, you should go to bed at the same time every night and give yourself six, seven, eight or nine hours of sleep. Then monitor the way you feel throughout the day to find out how many hours of sleep you need in order to feel your best. Once you find out how much sleep you need, you can work on improving the quality of your sleep. The main secret here is to allow yourself one or two hours to relax before going to bed. You may want to try and have a warm shower or bath before going to bed. Doing some quiet activities, such as reading or filing, can help some people relax. A warm drink in bed helps to induce sleepiness. Some people take up yoga or meditation to help them relax at night. Different techniques will work for different people, so it's best to experiment and find the one that suits you best. You should definitely avoid using technology before going to bed. Activities such as playing video games, watching TV and others which require you to use your attention can stop you from falling asleep. Avoid eating before going to bed. A late dinner can disrupt your sleep. Not only is going to bed with a heavy stomach bad for digestion and can make you overweight, but it can also keep you awake for hours. Caffeine-rich drinks can increase your heart rate, which can stop you from falling asleep. Energy drinks also have the same effect on your body. You should avoid drinking these at night. The same goes for vigorous physical exercise, such as weightlifting or working out on a treadmill. In many cases, you can reset your body clock and make it tick for you by changing your lifestyle. If your sleep deprivation is severe, it's always best to seek professional advice and get an appointment with your doctor, who might prescribe you sleeping pills. Now, we're grateful to Fred McKinnon for coming into the studio today to give everyone a few tips about the City Marathon that's taking place next Saturday. Thanks, Shweta. Yes, we're all very excited about the big event. Let me just remind listeners that a marathon is a 26-mile or 42-kilometre race, and this year we have 12,000 runners taking part. So, if you're thinking of going out to support the runners, and I know that many of you are, here are some tips to help make your day more enjoyable. First of all, be certain to plan your day. Don't leave everything to the last minute. Many roads are going to be closed. We don't have exact times for these closures yet, but my big advice to you is don't rely on your car to get you anywhere. In fact, the best way to get around the town will be on foot. You may choose to cycle, but you still won't be able to go on roads near the runner's route. Now, we did a broadcast last week in which we told all our runners to wear the right kind of shoes. And I'm going to tell you to put on sensible clothes. A lot of visitors will be coming to the city. You may be hunting for someone in the race that you want to support. The weather may be hot or it may be wet. Which leads me on to another thing. Make sure you look at the forecast on Friday night. If it's going to rain, take an umbrella. And if it's going to be hot... Take some drinks. However, please don't try to pass these to the runners. We already have hundreds of volunteers who'll be standing on the roadside, so let them give out the drinks. When you get into the town, find yourself a spot to stand in. You may well want to walk up and down the route, but please don't cross the road. There could be thousands of people running towards you, some very tired and not able to focus clearly. We don't want any accidents. And runners don't want obstacles like you in their path. What they do need is your support, particularly when their energies are low. So cheer them on. And for once, don't worry about noise. The louder, the better. Lastly, if you have friends or relatives who are taking part in the run, please don't say that you'll see them at the finish line. If everyone does that, the whole area will be terribly congested and you won't be able to find anyone. Well, that's most of the advice. Now, 
I mentioned transport earlier, and I've just got a few more bits of information about travel on the day. As I said before, roads in the town centre will be closed, but if you need to be picked up at your home, then you could take a taxi some of the way. Unlike the trams and trains, however, they'll be held up on the roads, so passengers shouldn't expect them to be as punctual as they normally are. Don't be put off by this, though. There'll be extra drivers working that day, and you'll get one eventually. Um, if you're meeting up with friends and want to be around when the runners set off, uh, that's 9am by the way, whatever end of the city you're coming from, I'd say use the trams. They still have routes that cross roads, and this will inevitably lead to some problems, but they're likely to have more reliable timetables than buses at this time of day. And, as you know, unlike taxis, they can carry plenty of passengers. Uh, lastly, the buses. Quite a number of bus routes will be altered slightly, and it's already been decided that some will be closed. There won't be fewer drivers, but they will be operating on different routes, and some will have longer breaks than they normally do. We'll be including a full list of all the bus routes and numbers, and where they'll be going, in this week's local paper. So uh, look out for that. Well, um, that's it for me. Uh, back to you, Shweta. Thanks very much, Fred. An event occurred in 1996 over a period of three days that attracted considerable attention at the time and led to a new find in Mungo National Park, which is the focal point of the Willandra Lakes World Heritage Area in New South Wales, Australia. I talked to Alan Moore, the organizer of this trip, about his experience. Alan, what was the purpose of your trip? Well, as you know, I love the outback and lead tours of people wanting to go into more remote parts of the country. However, I thought it was time for me too to have a holiday. So I packed up my family and we went to Mungo National Park. Why did you choose this location? It holds a record of Aboriginal life stretching back over 40,000 years. And of course, I wanted my young kids to be amazed by the main feature of the park, the remarkable Walls of China, as they're called, where wind and water erosion have exposed this long history. I see. What was the weather like? It was unusual for that time of year. The rain was just one continual downpour after another. We were always soaked to the skin. So we decided to cut our holiday short and only stayed three days in the end. However, it was eventful. The obvious problem was to get back to the nearest town, a small place called Boronga. But the dirt roads out there are always impassable after rain, so we settled down for a long, wet wait in the park. We didn't really mind because the scenery was so interesting. However, the kids wandered away without our noticing, and eventually we realized they must be lost. So we used our two-way radio to contact the park rangers and the police and a helicopter was sent. Luckily, the kids were found within a few hours, but they'd made an important discovery. So, the trip was also eventful for another reason, wasn't it? Yes, yes. They led us to some ancient aboriginal art. The kids had taken shelter in a very small, low cave that was difficult to see from the outside. We were lucky to have another family camping in our location. When they heard us calling the kids, they immediately helped us search for them, and as the hours went by, they also provided us with much-needed support and encouragement. We really appreciated their help, and as we were already soaked through after looking for the kids for a couple of hours, they even made sure we had enough dry clothes to wear. The park ranger managed to get through to us to lead the search, and when the helicopter pilot notified us by two-way radio that he'd seen the children but was unable to land nearby, we were able to eventually find them very excited about what was in their little cave. And what did you think of their cave? Well, after squeezing in, I must say I was impressed and managed to take a few photos of it before we left. There were many faint markings and dots on the wall. It was difficult to tell what they represented because they were so small, but people from the museum who have since visited there said the markings were similar to some other findings in the area and later confirmed they were very old. Although it's now a protected site, the children like to call it their cave and are allowed to visit it when a ranger can go with them. Thank you, Alan. If you go to Mungo National Park, you can see the entrance to the cave and some of Alan's photos at the ranger's station. Alan continues to lead tour groups in the outback, and if you want further information... So, here we are in Fairhaven, and we have a couple of hours to spend in this historic center before we carry on to our motel. 
And as you'll know from the itinerary of our trip, we're visiting Fairhaven because of its historical links with a man called Manjiro Nakahama. So I'll begin by giving you a brief overview of his life, and then you can explore the town at your leisure. Manjiro Nakahama, as he was then known, was born in 1827 in a village by the sea in what is now Toshishimazu in Japan. And like many people in that town, he became a fisherman when he was just a youngster. One day in 1841, when he was just 14 years old, he and some others were fishing far off the coast of Japan when they were caught in a storm and shipwrecked on a small deserted island. They had to wait for six months before they were rescued by an American whale ship that had stopped at the island by chance. Four of the five Japanese were put ashore in Hawaii, but Manjiro had become friends with the captain, William Whitfield, who came from the town of Fairhaven, where we are now, and he chose to remain aboard and to return with the boat to the USA. So Manjiro unwittingly became the first Japanese ever to set foot on American soil. He came back right here to Fairhaven with Whitfield and stayed with the Whitfield family, who paid for his education here in the town. He studied mathematics and geography, as well as shipbuilding and navigation. But he missed his mother and his own country. And eventually, he went back to Japan, where he had a responsible position as a university teacher and also served an invaluable role as interpreter during the initiation of relations between Japan and the United States in the middle of the 19th century. But the most interesting thing is that the links between Toshishimizu and Fairhaven have remained and grown stronger over the years, in spite of the distance between them. And in fact, the two places now have the official status of sister cities. Both places are ports, so in fact the inhabitants have a lot in common. There have been a number of visits by the inhabitants of Toshishimizu, in particular at the time of the festival, which is held every two years here in Fairhaven to celebrate the life and achievements of John Manjiro. It takes place in the fall, and there's an ever-growing program including drumming, singing, martial arts, and stalls selling Japanese and American food. So if you're going to be in the region around then, it's really worth a visit. Now, many of the buildings that Manjiro Nakahama knew in Fairhaven are still standing today. And so if you'd just like to hand round some copies of this map, I'll suggest the best route to follow to see them. Okay, so if you look at the bottom of the map, you can see the Millicent Library, and that's where we are now. Now, to follow the John Manjiro Trail, you go out of here along Center Street, and then head up Main Street until you get to Pilgrim Avenue. Go down there and turn right at the end. Go straight on, and just on the corner with Oxford Street, you'll see a two-story house. This is the Whitfield family house, and this is where Manjiro first stayed when he came to Fairhaven. It's still a private residence, so please respect the owner's privacy. Okay, now if you carry on along Oxford Street, then turn left at the end, you'll come to North Street, and about halfway down there is what's known as Old Oxford School. This was the very same school that Manjiro attended when he lived here. It was considered to be the best school in town because of the quality of the building. Unusually, it was built of stone, and the quality of the teaching. Nowadays, it's usually closed, except on special occasions. Go on to the end of North Street and turn the corner onto Adams Street. If you follow the road down, back towards the library, you go round a couple of sharp bends, and on the second of these, you can see the School of Navigation, which Manjiro also attended. And if you follow the road on, you'll soon find yourself back here at the library. And I'd suggest you spend some time looking round that, too, if you have any time left. Hello everyone! Welcome again to Consumer's Choice, which is the last in our present series. Isn't that right, Wendy? Yes, that's right. But we'll be back again after summer break with a new series. We'll tell you more about that later. But first, in today's programme, we start off with the missing photographs. We'll tell you a story of Miss Patty Ching, one of our listeners. We'll tell you how she has qualified for our Consumer of the Month award with her determination. Dennis? Thank you, Wendy. Well, Miss Patty Ching went on a holiday to Europe last month. This was her first ever trip abroad, and one for which she'd been saving for 10 years. Her tour took her around 12 countries in 21 days, and being a keen photographer, she took lots of photographs. 10 rolls of film, to be exact. About 360 photographs. When Patty got back home, she gave all her photos to top-class photo services for developing, and they vanished. 
she never saw them again. Of course, she was furious with the company and complained. They apologized and offered her compensation: ten free rolls of film. This made her even more angry, and she rejected this completely inadequate offer and asked for two thousand dollars. The company refused her request, so Patty wrote them a letter telling them to pay up in ten days, or she would take them to court. She received no reply, so she did take them to court. But two days before the case was due to be heard, she received a check for two thousand dollars. Top class had obviously made their minds up on how the judge would decide. Patty's case provides a lesson to all of us: if we want our rights as consumers, we've got to fight for them. So, for her determination and spirit, we name Patty our Consumer of the Month. Thank you, Dennis. And now, I'd like to deal with the problem that many of our listeners write about: sale prices. When we go to a sale and see a sign on something saying fifty percent off. Or three hundred dollars reduced to one hundred. How do we know the prices really have been reduced? One of our listeners, Mr. Alvin Locke, tells his story in a department store where I sometimes shopped. I saw a leather belt priced at a hundred dollars, too expensive for me, but I liked it and thought I might buy it next time the store had a sale. The store did have a sale, and I went back to look for the belt. It was there all right, but the ticket on it now read two hundred dollars reduced to a hundred and fifty. The sale price was actually higher than the normal price. What can we as consumers do in a case like this? The answer to Alvin's question is that at the moment, all we can do is to complain to the store's management and bring these cases to the attention of the public. Bad publicity might help to put a stop to this dishonest practice. Of course, making a fuss about faulty goods or bad service is never easy. Most people dislike making a fuss, but if something you have bought is faulty or does not do what was claimed for it. You are not asking for a favor to get it right. It is the shopkeeper's responsibility to take the complaint seriously and to replace or repair a faulty article or put right poor service, because he is the person with whom you have entered into an agreement. The manufacturer may have a part to play, but that comes later. So it's quite proper and reasonable to make a complaint about faulty goods or bad service. Well, Wendy. What do you think is the right way to do that? Well, the most important thing about making complaints, I think, is that they should be made to a responsible person in authority. Go back to the shop where you bought the goods, taking with you any receipt you may have. Ask to see the shop assistant in a large store. In a small store, the assistant may also be the owner, or you can complain directly. In a chain store, ask to see the manager. If you telephone, ask the name of the person who handles your inquiry. Otherwise, you may never find out who dealt with the complaint later. Even the bravest person finds it difficult to stand up in a group of people to complain. So, if you do not want to do it in person, write a letter. Stick to the facts and keep a copy of what you write. At this stage, you should give any receipt numbers, but you should not need to give receipts or other papers to prove you bought the article. If you are not satisfied with the answer you get, or if you do not get a reply. Write to the managing director of the firm, shop, or organization. Be sure to keep copies of your own letters and any you receive. Well, thank you for your good advice. It's nice for every consumer to take an action when he or she gets bad goods or service. And of course, the consumer's choice will continue to press for the government to bring in laws similar to those in other countries to protect consumers by making it illegal to cheat them in this way. Good morning, everyone. Today we have a special guest speaker. Laura Lanthor is director of the International Food Festival this year. Laura, can you tell us about what to expect at the festival? Of course, Vincent. This spring, people in the city can go to the seventh annual International Food Festival. This is a special event for the whole family. I do have to tell you, though, we are holding it at a different date than before. Easter is exceptionally early this year, and if the festival were held as usual, it would have fallen on the same weekend. This year, the festival will be held on the first week of April, before Easter. The festival will be held at the Walker Field grounds and will be divided into four main areas. There will be a Western food area with authentic representations of European cuisine. There will also be an East Asian section with chefs and products from Japan, Korea, and China.
A South Asian section will have food from India, Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia. For the first time this year, we will also have a Latin American section where people can try things from Mexico, various Caribbean countries, and South America. There will also be special booths where people can learn about all these cuisines. This year, we are expanding the cooking workshop and demonstration portion of the festival. Attendees last year really seemed to like learning about food and having a hands-on experience. I'll give you a brief description of three of the workshops we have. Like I said, these allow you to participate directly in the making of food and teach you techniques you can use at home. For a full list of them, please go to our online website. We will give you the site address after the end of my talk. You will also find there the procedure to pre-register for the workshops. Pre-registration takes place when you buy your festival tickets and is highly recommended. Non-Western food has become increasingly popular these days and many people are interested in how to cook such food at home. Such cuisines use a variety of different spices, ones that aspiring cooks might not be familiar with. Therefore, our world tour of spices is a good introduction to the flavor profiles of other cuisines. I would recommend it for adults who want to seriously learn about cooking. Small children might not take to the more exotic spices. One workshop that is meant for children is Candy Adventures. Their traditional activities like making gingerbread houses. Other activities teach basic decorating techniques including the proper use of coloring dye. Kids can also learn how to make flowers and other objects out of cake frosting. We understand the concerns of parents regarding their children's health, so everything used in this workshop is either sugar-free or uses acceptable sugar substitutes. Lastly, we have a workshop that is suitable for the whole family. Salads Forever is a workshop for everyone interested in healthy eating. There will be different kinds of salads that people can try and demonstrations that show how to make them. Salads have grown in popularity these days and are a healthy addition to any diet if prepared the right way. The workshop will also teach how to make healthy salad dressings. I'm afraid that's all I have today.